Kyle here from allmediareviews.blogspot.com. A um, bit of a video blog sort, and I want to talk about I guess I'm not going to be doing any specific separate reviews for those um, documentaries. Probably, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'll do like documentaries of the year, like review the, the I don't know, music documentaries or review or something. Anyway, so the first thing I was going to show is I did get a copy of the shaming of the true and the, the latest. This is like the sixth, seventh, eighth edition. Going to Discogs, just counting. Mean, there's the one two thousand, one like ninety nine or whatever that was two thousand. And there was like a two thousand eight, and there was like the then the that big book one, and there was the the foil one, the and then there was the um, of course the most recently was the vinyl, um, and we're gonna get the multi. This has got to be the seventh or eighth. The clear center of one, two. And it was advertised as like being a gatefold. I guess it's a gatefold in this sense. It opens up. Um, and you can see the credits. It says 2023 Gilbert Properties. I'm using my camcorder this time. I haven't, you know, I've had some issues with the cl clipping. Um, friend Frantic Dav, he was uh, saying that um, some of the audio on the... The ones I was doing with the list, the Kevin Gilbert list, was clipping anyway. I wanted to correct something. I mentioned, I think, Turn on Salvador and Vaclav Havel. You know, that's about Del Salvador Dali, the, the artist. But I know it's like about surrealism and everything. You know, Kevin talks about that in, the, in that Toy Matinee Plays live, slash Live with the Roxy. But I haven't heard this yet. I haven't listened to it, but it's another remix. I mean, really, we're, really, we're waiting for the... Um, I mean, it might have been remixed again. We're waiting for um, Century Park East, the multi-disc, which the Kevin Gilbert Estate, they issued this. There's a new podcast from Bruno from New York here. He talked about uh, some other stuff, mostly caviar related. I mentioned this in the, the Kevin Gilbert songs video I did earlier this week. Um, but there's other stuff coming, the um, KMG archive series uh, next month. The caviar and then one other and then two more this year later um you know the can the the, the chamber of the true multi-desk is in the works so another related thing is i'm yeah i'm in the next say like month maybe the next few weeks i'm going to try to sit down and do the a more extensive um proper review of <laughs> i just caught oops of um of the thud anniversary i should wait till 2025 when it's 10 years old like the 30 year anniversary but no, um, I mean I did go over it when I first bought it. I, that that unboxing video, or the unbox, but the, but um, yeah, the thud. I've been listening to that a, a decent amount. I think I need to really go more in depth about it because some of those compositions are, frankly, I like them more than some of the thud versions even. And so you know I should become more familiar with them, and I'm becoming more familiar with them. I just kind of listened to it when it came out and never thought to go back to it that often, other than like Big Heart. Um, so. So that's that the Kevin Gilbert related portion of the um, of the of the video blog. Um, so a lot of stuff have coming. I haven't prepared, but I am looking to maybe next week the 2023 preview, which I've taught. I just do this ongoing, but you know people have done that. It's hard to say. It's music doesn't come out. You know. Doesn't get announced to come out specifically at the beginning of the year. And it's all based on when they're gonna ready to release it. So it could be now, it could be six months from now, it could be a year and a half from now. A lot of this stuff. Um, but I will try to do a preview, sort of the stuff that's been confirmed, the stuff that's the titles that have obviously been announced, and the speculation. And you know, stuff is sort of slowly coming. Um, I mean, the last few weeks I've noticed a couple of um, names that weren't like on my radar but are definitely names that i'm gonna li i'm gonna check out there's a new new pornographers album for one thing um coming and you know i think i put out an album a few years ago i think i can't remember i was kind of into them and i um for a while there and then i kind of concluded around 2011 2012 kind of just kind of jumped they kind of jumped the shark i've listened to some of the other records but i i became less of a fan i saw them live I want to say I saw them twice. I saw them live at least once. And I know that there was sort of friction stuff. Because the New Pornographers are a band that, 
frankly, sort of a, it's like a super group per se. It's a bunch of other mus musicians that got together and collaborated and, um, Nico Case, you know, um, Dan Behar and AC Newman, um, anyway, um, but that, that, I didn't know that was coming out. I mean, Kimber's album comes out tomorrow. You have, I'm kind of just doing it right now. You have Black Bell Eagle Scout also coming out. When is that? That's soon. It's not this month. I think it's next month on the 10th of February. Um, but yeah, the new, the new progress is coming out on the 31st. So that's it. So, um, new Jethro Tull's coming out too, but I mean, it's more of just like Johnny Anderson and some of these others that are, um, anticipated the Peter Gabriel, obviously anticipated by the end of the year, gradually stuff about the deer hunter and some of these other releases are, are being worked like more on police have posted on social media. Um, they put out, you know, titles and stuff like that. And, but it's just so slow, you know, you know, they could all be announced within a week or two, you know, but so, um, what's the other uh, tours and stuff like that? And Mickey Dolan's is coming to Minneapolis after we already confirmed him. We're going to Milwaukee to see him, but we're going to see that that got announced. Um, you know, so I may as well just get into the, the documentaries. I thought there was some other topics per se, um, music related. I mean, there's of course other stuff. Um, television, the new Night Court is so-so, the revival. I wish they'd bring um, Richard Maul back, but I don't know if it's going to happen. I didn't realize they'd killed his character. I wasn't a fanatic, fanatical Night Court fan, but I liked the show, and, you know, you have some of the cast that aren't around, of course, anymore, but you do have um, John Larroquette, and you bring Melissa Rauch on from um, Big Bang Theory. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's some other stuff that has come up Television and um, that's just the world part two, the Mel Brooks thing that's going to be on Hulu soon. Um, some anniversaries, that's the other thing. Um, there's anniversary albums like I don't know if I want to spoil it or not. I mean, two of like my favorite like fifty to hundred albums of all time are having sort of milestone anniversaries one more than another in the next few weeks um there's more i mean just think about just talk about five and ten year windows of time you know you have anything from 73 78 83 88 93 98 2003 2008 um but speaking of i'm doing the 2005 song list uh i've been pretty immersed in this and oh man i so much like nostalgia for this year and a, a year that I wish I could go back in time. Sometimes I wish I could go back to that year and just like <laughs> take in a lot of this music and just the nostalgia and the memories, the sort of melancholy memories. But I, um, on Spotify and Spotify doesn't even have everything, you know, and I'm not putting just one song per band or one song per album. Um, I have a list here that I, I, I've been adding to over the last week. I made it um, maybe over a year ago I started one because I've always loved 2005, but it's 111 songs now, so um, I know those those lists have ballooned out, those songs of the year. I'm going to have to kind of see what the cream of the crop ends up being. It might just be 100. Or, I don't know, but I'm going to do that probably within the next few days and just put it up. Maybe I'll do a separate video if I, I create the list on Rate Your Music like I've done. So... Let's just get in, get on to it. So I saw two documentaries in the last month, music related. One being the um, so insert image here, I guess you'd say. <laughs> um, images are probably like a double image, probably at the beginning of the video. Um, the Ronnie James Dio documentary, um, which I don't, is it just called Dio? I forget. It's on. I think it's on Showtime. If you have access to Showtime, uh um, it came out, I think, last summer, but I hadn't seen it, and it, it was, it's on Showtime, and then I found a link. It's called Dio Dreamers Never Die. The second one is the Elephant Six uh, recording company. So I'll talk about the Dio one first, just my, as brief as I can, synopsis or take and review on it. It was pretty good. I mean, I didn't know everything about his past, how, like, how much he recorded, how his dad forced him to play trumpet and practiced. And I did play trumpet, but he became like a, just a, a savant, like 
tactician as a musician and then became a singer as a result of um, playing trumpet so religiously. But he recorded in bands and some music way before the Beatles. Like it was like, what do you say, early 60s or late 50s? Um, but, and then like everything that transpired with one of his band members passing away. But I mean, stylistically, they was, he was doing stuff like of early rock and roll. Um, like I said, pre-Beatles, really, and then during the Beatles era. I mean, he had a great voice then. Um, and he's such a small guy, I knew. But um, he's from, what did they say, Pennsylvania? I can't remember. Um, somewhere on the East Coast. And so, anyway, I mean, I the truth is, when he passed away, I mean, I'd known his name, I'd heard... I heard some Rainbow and maybe a little bit of the Sabbath stuff. I liked Last Sabbath... I got into them a little bit when I was in high school, a little before then. I brought, the, I remember it was in high school, Children of the Grave, which is a different name for like volume four. Um, but I never had, like I wasn't as familiarized with the Dio era. Um, but, you know, it really took, people were talking about them in the metal symbol, of course, that he, I don't know, his, his, his grandmother, I guess? His mother, I forget what. You know, it was like two weeks ago I saw the documentary, but basically used to use this to, to ward off spirits and evil spirits, whatever, but I don't think she invented it, and of course Dio, like, sort of got people using it that have nothing, that are, are signing it, using the sign that has nothing to do with metal or heavy metal or music. Um, anyway, it's, he got known for that. I sort of knew about that, but I didn't know that much until some of the people online were talking about him, you know, the, and then, then he got, they were talking about how he was sick, you know, Eddie Trunk talked about him, interviewed him, but and then when he did pass away in 2010, I kind of binged his music a little bit for a few days. I remember that. Um, listened to Rainbow Rising and um, Rainbow Rising, the second Rainbow album, too. And um, I listened to his solo album, Holy Diver, and then Heaven and Hell, the Black Sabbath um, album. He, the first one, I believe. So... I, you know, I was like, yeah, I can see why people really love this guy. He has a great voice, and he was just he's very distinct, very unique, very uh, powerful, very um, attention-grabbing uh, for such a small guy. Of course, he had been in before he was in Rainbow with Richie Blackmore. He'd been in the band um, Elf, which fit, because I mean, the whole band, I guess, were pretty small, but, you know, they were small in stature, but large in, in uh, attention and... Um, you know, voice or whatever. Um, but, oh, you know, the other thing I did know about him, and I was just reminded that he had been in the Tenacious D movie, which was kind of disappointing, I remember, when it came out. I was, I became a pretty big Jack Black fan. It was before even, um, I, you know, School of Rock came out. But when School of Rock came out, I was like, yes, this guy is hilarious. I mean, I had known Tenacious D before that. Um, and then I'd seen High Fidelity, but I didn't realize that was Jack Black, of course, and putting two and two together, go back to it. But, um, you know, I remember when the, the, when the, when the Tenacious D movie came out, it was like they should have come out, should have come out before, they'd done sketches on, like, HBO before that, or then, like, a show, I think it was a show. But, um, he, um, it was, it was like, it was like, he was at his sort of peak of, sort of, he was going way up in terms of his comedy and his popularity and visibility, and it, like it was like a year or two after that and I felt like it was done over the top and um, I should go back to it I probably would like it more now I remember also Be Kind Rewind from Michelle Gondry came out not that long after that around the, around the same time and that also was sort of disappointing because I love Michelle Gondry and I like Mostaf, Mostaf, I don't know if he says his name but um, I liked him in um, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy movie he hasn't, I haven't seen him in a long time in anything really either but um Anyway, so getting that, getting back to yeah, so he was in the the he played Jack Black's like he like kind of like spirit like his you know God or his guy he worshipped of course gods of rock you know, um, but I should go back I should probably I could go for revisiting of that movie, so he had been in that and um, you know everything that happened with his career with with when he was with Elf and then they loved Deep Purple and then everything with. Richie Blackmore. I talked a lot about Richie Blackmore. The interview, Lita Ford. 
Oh, who else? Roger Glover's in there. You know, I actually saw Deep Purple the first time in 98 with Dream Theater and ALP, and I got a pick from Roger Glover at that show. Um, but anyway, he ended up forming Rainbow because Deep Purple were going in a direction that Richie didn't like. Richie Blackmore is pretty quiet, you know, I mean, he's sort of elusive, one of these kind of um, introverted types, I guess, even though it's very centered on his way is the only way. I know similarly he would kind of connect with like Robert Fripp or Neil Peart or something like that, kind of an eccentric type, but, um, uh, you know, it was great that he formed Rainbow, it made sense, and Rainbow, you know, like Stargazer was this epic classic that even Dream Theater covered, um, and, you know, it is, it's a terrific song. Um, it's too bad that Rainbow didn't continue on with him for that much longer, they, you know, did a couple records, and Rainbow, you know, they were like, they were like on the cusp of becoming like iconic, but, um, or like sort of a household name. But then, you know, he had the opportunity with Sabbath, you know, Black Sabbath and that whole thing. Uh, and then there's some differences that happen there. I mean, I guess it kind of speaks to maybe Ronnie James Dio worked best, you know, on his own. Like when he was a little bit like Kevin Gilbert in a way, where he played in bands, did music with other people, but he actually worked best when he sort of is doing his own vision. Um, and he, who, how can you argue? The guy is just, was it, he was a, you know, iconic, you know, fantastic singer and songwriter. And um, he created this aura about, you know, it is metal, but it's not all about um, Satan or, you know, death or anything like that. It can be about sort of fantasy and um, also the classical in influence that he brought in. Um, so, yeah, and then he had this solo career. I mean, you know, I learned a fair amount, you know, and I, I'd known, I'd seen a lot of interviews with him, but he's really a down-to-earth guy, really like a realist. He's not someone who abused drugs or anything either. Unfortunately, how he died was, uh, you know, unexpected. He wasn't that old. He was like in his mid-60s. So, um, anyway, so, yeah, I give it a thumbs up, uh, especially if you don't know that much about Ryan James Dio. Um, or are obviously a fan and haven't got the chance. It's, there's a link online that was on YouTube. It's not on YouTube anymore. But also, if you have access to Showtime, I don't know if it'll eventually hit like Netflix or one of the other like sites like Amazon Prime. You could order it. I'm not sure. So, so moving on to the second documentary I saw recently, The Elephant Six Company, which The Elephant Six Company or The Elephant Six is the so-called, you know, the the, wet, the record label of sorts that was formed by a bunch of different musicians. Uh, most, like, most prominently, you'd say Robert Schneider from the Apples and Stereo. It was formed in, it sounds like it was, like, the early 90s. Um, all these, these musicians that, you know, had, they were in a small town in, it was Louisiana, yeah. Um, just remembering everything about it. And, um, I mean, to put it, to put it, to, to, to shorten it as possible, I'm trying to make this as short as possible, but it never ends up being, um, the, the bands that were on the Elephant Six label, the Apples and Stereo, uh, Neutral Milk Hotel, um, the Olivia Tremor Control, those are the three primary bands. Now, I know Of Montreal later had some music that was released, at least some of the members of Montreal were part of that scene. Uh, like Kevin Barnes has interviewed a, a singer from up in Montreal. Um, but I know he eventually resided in Atlanta if he wasn't from there. Anyway, there's other bands too besides that. I mean, you know, I, I'm a fan of the Apples in Stereo. Living in Tremor and Control, I've liked here and there. They're, it's psychedelic. There's a, a strong influence by the music that came out of Elephant Six from... Like, the psychedelic 60s especially, um, the Beatles, the Beach Boys, and Pink, Pink Floyd, that's, those are the ones I think of a little bit. It's like psychedelic pop. Now, Neutral Milk Hotel, I liked them for maybe a couple weeks back in like 2007, and I realized the singer, Jeff Mangum, wasn't for me. Um, but people love them. They, they're, they're actually, the, in some ways, probably the biggest name among all the bands. Um, I just was gonna pull up. There's a couple. Um, they got the the name. You know, they they interview, of course, Robert Schneider. They inter they they show um. Das, 
Not Alan Doss from Galactic Cut from um, Galactic Cowboys. Um, but they show interviews with him. Bill Doss. Um, I was just gonna look up because they, they 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 interviewed and they talked about a bunch of other bands that I I'd heard of. Um, yeah, there's a lot of there's a long list. Okay, yeah, of Montreal's on Elf Power was one of them. Um, that they talked about the documentary specifically. There was like one the music tapes maybe. Um, some of these names are kind of interesting. The Sunshine Fix. Um, I mean, this is why I kind of wish I had done the done a review of it the day after I'd seen. I'll admit though, I was it was a circulatory system. I know that band. I don't know if they, that's the I don't know if they were in there or not. Um, anyway, they. I wish I had. I had. I would have been able to been been more fresh in my mind. I end up. That day was sort of it's a long day. My wife had been taking this class at the at a, a night class after after work and everything like that. And I actually the the roads weren't great. I ended up driving her to work and picking her up and dropping her off. So it's kind of a long day in some ways. So I was actually dozing off from part of it. Um, I mean, getting into it, they you know the story of apples and stereo is interesting. They didn't talk about that much of the apples and stereo period that I. And more familiar, New Magnetic Wonder and um, Travels in Spi Time and Space. They showed um, Elijah Wood, who's a, a huge fan. He he was actually in the little promo for Travelers in Time and Space. But, um, yeah, I mean, they interviewed... Robert Schneider's not a musician anymore, really. I mean, he's, he's a musician, but he doesn't record or play music that I'm aware of. He's actually a mathematician as it, in Denver. I thought it was, it was Emory University, though, but that's, like, in Louisiana. Anyway, Apples and Sierra eventually ended up in Denver, but, um, and some of the bands, like, of Montreal ended up in Atlanta. So, like, Janelle Monet had Kevin Barnes' guest appear on her second album, the Arc Android, or debut album, Arc Android. That's probably a large reason why, because she was in Atlanta, and she probably got to know, uh, Kevin Barnes, um, but, yeah, they had a fair amount about Neutral Milk Hotel and Jeff Mangum. Jeff Mangum was not interviewed. He's always been, he's a little bit like um, Richie Blackburn, that he's been reclusive. I don't think he, he did, didn't give a lot of interviews. I know when the Sound Opinions guys interviewed Robert Schneider and did a whole episode, a, a podcast on Elephant Six, he wasn't available for an interview. I know they Robert was talking about him. and But I know Neutral Milk Hotel did a reunion. They broke up and then he was like nowhere to be found he was like you know hiding away in the woods or whatever but then he did a reunion that was like a big deal in like the early 2010s like 2011 2012 um but yeah bill doss from the liver tremor control unfortunately passed away i think it was 2012 and that that kind of in some ways threw off um robert schneider and that inspired him to just you know seek out what he wanted to do to pursue a degree in to be a mathematician um because robert schneider is really an, an interesting guy he's his philosophy and his use of like you know science and um technology with the apples and stereo especially the last few records i mean the the early apples and stereo records are more low fi and they're they're kind of like the early cloud cult they're they're interesting you know home recording experiments in some ways a lot of that was diy stuff it was like home tapers, that kind of stuff. But I kind of got won over by their style when they later. You also get a lot with Hillary Sidney, who was married, was part of the Apples and Stereo. She was married to uh, Robert Schneider for a while. I know the marriage didn't last, I don't think. But um, I don't know. All I know is that she wasn't in the band when I saw them the last couple times I did see them live, unfortunately. I was, even though she plays on New Man Magnetic Wonder, which is the one, my, go my, my favorite album from the Apples in Stereo, and she sings. But, um, you know, it's interesting that she was at least involved in this documentary. And um, I, I remember I wanted to pursue to, like, check out some of her music a few years ago when I found out she wasn't, like, her, her like, history. She was the one who did the female vocals, and she does the drumming on that. And they said that when they had her as their drummer, like, she just wanted to play drums. She would never had played drums, but, you know, I think Robert had already been with in a relationship with her. I'm not sure, but, you know, it was like she was a good enough drummer, yet she hadn't had the experience. A lot of these guys, actually, a lot of the people in the bands from Apples, Olivia, Olivia Trevor Control, 
um, were not like clat like you know professionally or classically trained like a lot of musicians. They were sort of learning their instruments on their own. Um, I can't remember Will Cullen Hart. That's the other one I think he's interviewed. Yeah, um, and I think he's from Olivia Tremor Control also. Yes. Um, yeah, in, in Louisiana. So, yeah, he was part of the Sunshine Fix also. Um, the weird thing is, Olivia Tremor Control played the Varsity Theater. I remember it was like I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe a little less. They were actually giving away tickets on Radio K and everything like that. And I wanted to go and I didn't. And I kind of regretted that ever since. Just because I thought they would, they would probably put out a really trippy, you know, live experience like School of Seven Bells did or whatever. Um, but I didn't make, I know that it was either, there was either conflict or there was a reason why I didn't end up making, there was a lot of other shows around the same time, but, um, cause I've listened to some of their albums, like that one black, like black page or, um, that black, black codes and bandages. This isn't clan zoo, black foliage animation music. Yeah. And then they talked about how, cause they, they had like recorded like a, one or two records and then, Kind of gone on hiatus. They maybe played live, but they were trying to make their 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 follow up record for a long time. They show some footage of that in there. So, um, Bill Doss, though, I'd also mentioned, did appear on the last Apples and Stereo record, even though he's a member of um, Livia Tremor Control. Livia Tremor Control, I guess, technically is still an active band. Will Cullen Hart and um, but um, Bill Doss was, a, of course, he passed away as a former member. And Jeff Mangum actually had been with them in the early days. Because that, that was kind of the thing about, they said about the, the Elephant Six bands, is that a lot of them, a lot of these guys, Robert Schneider, um, Jeff Mangum, Bill Doss, they played on each other's records. They even wrote songs for each other. So in some ways, the Elephant Six company, Elephant Six bands are all sort of like one band in variations. Now, Neutral Milk Hotel and their airplane over the sea is... You know, I'm sure Robert Sanders on there. I'm just, you know, I've, it, it became this hipster darling record and it got worshipped for a while there. It hasn't been as much recently. And just uh, the nasal style vocals just completely turned me off. I remember there was a couple bands I checked out that were influenced by them. And that was like, oh, no wonder it's going to be like Neutral Milk Hotel. But, um, you know, I, I know people love them. But I was just saying Bill Doss sings on one or two tracks on Travelers in Time and Space. And his voice reminds me kind of of Roger Manning of Jellyfish. I always wondered if the Roger Manning, the Jellyfish, and then of course Self and Sponge Bath. Now that I mentioned to the guy at Sound and Scene at the, the presentation that I went to, it's like you guys should do a documentary. There should be a documentary on Sponge Bath. You know, Self. You know, Matt Mahaffey. They had Fluid Ounces on there. I believe the first Call Florence Powell record was also on there. It was a similar aesthetic. Um, while I enjoy Elephant Six, especially Apples and Stereo, a lot of the music, of course, my my bias toward Apes and Androids or Call Forms Paw and Self, especially, uh, would <laughs> be in more favor. But, you know, there's a podcast that was done with Matt Mahaffey about a couple months ago that he talks a lot about, at least a fair amount, about Sponge Bath Records, which was in Tennessee. I just, you know, you'd think that that would be more known. It was a similar ideal. Came out a little bit later, but... There's a few of those different, like, little record labels that found, you know, the Paisley Park stuff, the Paisley, Paisley Park, Paisley Underground, rather, that scene in California, which was influenced by Prince uh, and sort of that psychedelic stuff, like, uh, what is it, Around the World in whatever it is, uh, in 100 Days, um, or 80 Days, I forget. Anyway, that's kind of my shtick on it. I, I guess overall... I liked it. My my new barber actually is a big music fan. He was raving about it. I didn't go to the previous screening that was at the festival back in November. I, I, I guess overall, I thought it was okay, but it didn't have as much as I might have liked to like, you know, like say it's just, you're going to just get won over by Elephant Six by watching. It's good. It was a music documentary, um, but I, you know, I'm not saying I was, you know, of the two documentaries, I think the Dia one I liked a little more, but, um, but yeah, I guess I could say, you know, it was a decent documentary. I, I would think, I would like to just see a documentary on the Apples and Stereo just with Robert Schneider alone. Um, but you do get a fair amount on him. Um, actually, I think Pepe Deluxe, I'd be curious if Robert's ever listened to or seen any of the Pepe Deluxe videos because you watch some of this, the videos they did, some of the aesthetic. Pepe Deluxe, actually, that sort of neo-psychedelia among, you know, modern progressive art rock or whatever the modern 
psychedelic music of the modern age of the last 20 or 30 years. It's not really modern anymore. Um, but I, I would say that the neo-psychedelia is a, a genre that I like a lot of. Some of it I do not like, like Tame Impala, but some of it I do like, and uh, Pepe Deluxe sort of falls in that, that retro, modern music sounding retro. It's the same thing with a lot of the Elephant Six stuff, especially Apples. I, I really wonder if anyone in the Apples and Stereo ever heard Pepe Deluxe, and if Pepe Deluxe knows the Apples and Stereo, I wouldn't be surprised. So, But anyway, that's uh, the long um, uh, video blog for today, you know, Thursday, uh, January 26th. Um, curious if you've seen the documentaries, but thank you for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't subscribed, and we'll see you next time.